Um, just, uh, okay, this is on the constitutional renewal. Um, I'm Alex Allen. Uh, you've then got Scott McPherson from the uh, Cabinet Office and uh, Vijay Rangarajan from the Ministry of Justice, but they'll say a little bit about themselves um, when they uh, get on. We're going to, I'm going to start off and set out the background from the 1997 election up to when the changeover of Prime Minister from uh, Tony Blair to Gordon Brown. Uh, Scott is then going to deal with the events from uh, then until the uh, setting up of the Democratic Renewal Council uh, earlier this year, of which he's one of the secretaries. And then Vijay will discuss some of the themes and uh, issues that are uh, coming forward through the Constitutional Renewal Program. I want to go right back to the second or third day of, of the Labour government. Um, I was actually working in number 10 then. I was the Prime Minister's Principal Private Secretary. And uh, on the Sunday, we all went up to Islington to Tony Blair's house, uh, partly because I think you know, he had enough of coming into Downing Street then and uh, decided he wanted a day at home. And uh, Gordon Brown, who was the Chancellor, arrived for a uh, bilateral. And they, uh, in, in one of the things that they were immediately saying was, and you know, we'll announce tomorrow we're making the Bank of England independent, whereupon the couple of civil servants of us who were there were saying, um, do you want any advice on this or do you want a paper on this? Because it hadn't actually been uh, shadowed beforehand and they were absolutely clear, no, they were going to do this. And uh, it was duly announced on the Monday to Parliament. And it was, uh, I mean, I've included it here as a constitutional change because I do think it's one of the uh, things that would be very hard uh, for a government subsequently to reverse. Um, and that in some ways is one of the tests of is something a constitutional change, is, is it in some ways reversible? And I think if you contemplate going back to the chance of the Exchequer deciding interest rates, um, which is what used to happen when I worked in the Treasury back in the 80s, uh, I think that would be very hard to envisage. I think the uh, tradition now of having the Bank of England uh, as an independent body with a monetary policy committee setting interest rates is uh, very strongly entrenched. Uh, and then a week later, they, uh, the government announced the removal of um, the responsibility for banking supervision from the Bank of England uh, to the Financial Services Authority. I mean, that, of course, is something that is slightly, um, turned out slightly more controversial and something where there are um, toings and froings between the Bank of England and the FSA at the moment about what their respective responsibilities should be. One of the things that the... Um, Conservative, I mean, the Labour government came in very much committed to was devolution to Scotland, Wales, and Northern Ireland. Um, they uh, fairly soon after uh, they got elected, they passed referendum bills through the uh, Houses of Parliament and had referenda in Scotland and Wales. Uh, the referendum in Scotland was passed uh, pretty comprehensively. The one in Wales was actually quite a narrow. Uh, win, but it was a win. And following that, the uh, Scottish Parliament and the Welsh Assembly were set up in 1999. Um, I mean, the Scottish, they're, they're slightly different beasts. Um, the Scottish Parliament has um, got primary legislative powers over the subjects that are devolved to it and uh, is you know, very much, you know, for something like health, it is a uh, a, a Scottish government responsibility in Scotland, and it's nothing to do with the uh, Department of Health in London. Uh, and for, similarly for the other subjects that are devolved. Um, for the Welsh Assembly, uh, it was initially set up with only secondary legislation powers, uh, and any sort of primary legislation, any main change, had to be um, passed through the UK Parliament. But subsequently, in 2006, there was a Government of Wales Act which gave uh, the Welsh Assembly some primary legislative powers, um, I mean, subject still to UK Parliament's veto or Secretary of State's veto. Um, the Northern Ireland uh, Assembly followed on from the Good Friday Agreement. It was done on a slightly different track. Um, it's got a, a rather different system with um, power sharing very much uh, entrenched in the Constitution. So they have a, uh, 
a first minister from one of the uh, denominations and a uh, uh, and the deputy first minister from another. Uh, and um, that's been going. It, it, was, it started in 1999. It was then suspended um, f until 2000. And, sorry, it was suspended from 2002 until 2007, but then uh, got uh, uh, reinstated when there was agreement reached between the parties in Northern Ireland. And there's now progress going towards further devolution, uh, particularly devolution of responsibility for justice to Northern Ireland. Um, more recently, there's been the Calman Commission looking at the powers and responsibilities of the Scottish Parliament and come forward with a, a number of recommendations, uh, including uh, particularly a change in the formula for financing uh, the Scottish Parliament so that uh, it would have more direct revenues uh, of its own. The, one of the next things that the... Uh, government did was uh, start on House of Lords reform, though there is more to come, which Vijay will say something about later on. But in 1999, the government uh, legislated to remove all but 92 hereditary peers from the House of Lords. Uh, it also set up the House of Lords Appointments Commission, which um, has responsibility for um, appointing uh, non-political peers to the uh, House of Lords. Uh, it takes nominations and uh, puts them forward there. The Prime Minister um, has formally to sign it off, but in practice that is a formality. Uh, and then the Prime Minister has a certain right to appoint uh, a number of others himself, for example, ministers uh, and one or two others, like former Chiefs of Defence staff and things like that. Um, the, um, there was a, in, in 2007, there was a a vote in the uh, well in both uh, houses of parliament on further devolution, which produced Commons majorities for both 80% elected and for wholly elected. Uh, but the Lords voted for a continuation of a wholly appointed um, house. As I say, well, VJ will say a bit more about that a little later on. Uh, one of the other things the government did quite early on was the, uh, a certain amount of electoral reform, particularly uh, setting up the uh, Political Parties Elections and Referendum Act, uh, which for the first time uh, regulated political parties, uh, imposed control over donations. Uh, it set up the Electoral Commission, which regulates elections. Um, one of the things that um, the government has looked at periodically is reform of electoral voting systems. And indeed, um, the, a number of the other bodies that are now around have different voting systems. The Scottish and Welsh uh, parliaments have what's called additional member systems, uh, whereby um, you vote for an individual in your constituency, but then there's a top-up list which... Uh, balances out the parties who didn't get a candidate through on the first-past-the-post system. Um, then there are um, a number of other ones, uh, including uh, a single transferable vote for the European elections. The government has so far maintained the principle of first-past-the-post system for uh, parliamentary elections. But if you live in London now, I mean, you can have four different systems of voting. You can have first past the post when you vote in a, uh, a general election for a constituency member of parliament. You can have the additional member system when you vote for the London Assembly. You can have a supplementary vote system whereby you get to vote for one person but also express a second preference when you vote for the mayor of London. And you can have a vote in a single transferable vote system for the European Parliament elections. So one of the interesting uh, twists has been the setting up of a, of a large number of different types of electoral systems in the UK. One of the uh, things, the other things the government did was make provision for directly elected mayors. And in London, there was a referendum uh, for um, dealing with um, the setting up the London Assembly and directly elected mayors, which passed. And first of all, Ken Livingstone, then Boris Johnson have been elected uh, mayor of London. There's also provision for other 
local authorities to uh, have referendums and, uh, and, and set up directly elected mayors. So far, there have been uh, 35 uh, councils who've gone forward to, for referendums for directly elected mayors, um, of whom 12 have uh, the referendums turned out to support the idea, yes vote, uh, and 23 the vote's been no. They're fairly scattered around the country. There's no obvious pattern. I mean, the yeses include Doncaster, Watford, Lewisham, Middlesbrough, Torbay. The noes include Cheltenham, Sunderland, Harrow, Plymouth, Darlington. So there, there's no real pattern. Of course, and then there's Stoke, which voted yes for a directly elected mayor in 2002, but then voted no to remove him in 2008. The next reform I want to talk about is, um, freedom of, sorry, is freedom of information, which was, the Act was passed in 2000, but it wasn't actually introduced until uh, 2005. And I think it's begun to have uh, quite a uh, significant impact on uh, a lot of uh, how government works. And at all levels, I mean, it, it doesn't just apply to central government departments, it applies uh, to local authorities, it applies to a large number of, uh, of, of, of bodies other than just government departments. And a huge amount of information is produced under freedom of information all the time. I mean, the most, uh, and, and in some ways, the most significant use of it is actually people who want local information. They want to find the information about the number of muggings in their local park. Uh, and so on, the sort of information that would previously have been denied them, but which you now can get under freedom of information. There have clearly been some more controversial issues. There was, there's been a long-running uh, saga about the cabinet minutes on um, the decisions to go to war in Iraq, where eventually uh, the case was the information commissioner uh, said they should be. It was appealed to the information tribunal who said they should be, and then the government decided to exercise its right to veto the release. Um, more recently, there's, um, and of course, one of the big issues that's emerged out of freedom of information has been details of members of parliament's expenses, which again was a long-running freedom of information request fought through to the, uh, um, through the commissioner and to the tribunal, and eventually, um, after, I think, thinking of going to the high court, the parliament decided it would publish them all and that, of course, has led to all the uh, furore that we know about. Um, the government also uh, set up a review uh, fairly recently under Paul Dacre on, on, on the 30-year rule, which is tied in to uh, this, which is where the um, government papers are basically closed for 30 years and then released to the public. Uh, and most of the exemptions in the Freedom of Information Act fall away after 30 years. Um, the Dacre had recommended um, that uh, the 30-year rule should be reduced to 15 years. The government has uh, accepted it should be reduced, but said 20 years. Uh, and that will be phased in gradually, um, doing two years at a time for 10 years until we've, until we've got to uh, a 20-year rule, but with some um, additional protections for uh, things like cabinet papers to make sure that... Uh, they remain exempt for the full 20 years. Um, another big change was the uh, Human Rights Act, which um, was introduced in 1998. In practice, it basically what it did was incorporate the European Convention on Human Rights into UK law, so that uh, rights which previously, if you wanted to uh, secure them. The United Kingdom was one of the very early signatories to the convention in the 1950s. Um, but if you wanted to uh, secure your rights under the convention, you had to uh, apply to the European Court of Human Rights in Strasbourg, which was a complicated and difficult process. Now, under the Human Rights Act, you're able to enforce your rights in UK courts. And that's um, begun to have quite a big impact. And there have been a number of uh, um, quite significant cases, I mean, including um, uh, issues about control orders and what is the rights of uh, terrorist suspects. Uh, and uh, I mean, another one which, um, I mean, actually, I think did in the end get appealed all the way to Strasbourg was on whether prisoners uh, should have rights to vote. 
The final uh, one I want to talk about is the what was called the Constitutional Reform Act, and this sprang up in 2003 when, as part of a reshuffle, Tony Blair announced that the post of Lord Chancellor was going to be abolished and the functions uh, split out. So the, the office of Lord Chancellor would go. Uh, the Lord Chancellor had previously been head of the judiciary. That then passed to the Lord Chief Justice. He'd also been Speaker of the House of Lords. That passed to a new uh, elected Speaker of the House of Lords. Uh, he'd been responsible for appointing judges. Uh, that responsibility passed to a newly set up Judicial Appointments Commission. Uh, and in fact, I mean, the, it caused some controversy. I was uh, in the Department for Constitutional Affairs during a lot of this. Uh, the bill attracted a lot of attention, partly because it turned out to be very much harder to abolish the office of Lord Chancellor than anybody realized when the announcement had been made. And uh, in the end, the office wasn't abolished. And so Jack Straw is still the Lord Chancellor and uh, wears his, his great robes. But um, it is a very different role. He's basically the Secretary of State for justice now. Uh, at that point, I'm going to hand over to Scott McPherson. Good afternoon, Ooh, this microphone. Good afternoon everyone. Um, I'm Scott McPherson from the Economic and Domestic Affairs Secretary in the Cabinet Office. Uh, for those of you who don't know what EDS does, uh, it essentially supports the Prime Minister in running Cabinet and Cabinet committees to enable them to take collective decisions for the whole government. And we also provide policy advice to the Prime Minister on domestic policy issues. So I'm going to pick up the story from Alex in uh, the 10th of June 2007, when uh, Gordon Brown becomes Prime Minister. But on the 10th of June, uh, the Prime Minister made a statement to Parliament in which he said, sorting out expenses is not enough. We need to go further than that and have some more fundamental reform. Um, he announced the creation of a, a new piece of legislation to set up an independent parliamentary standards authority and also announced the creation of a new democratic renewal council. Now you might ask what is a democratic renewal council uh, and what's it supposed to do? Um, it's actually a cabinet committee essentially in the same way as any other cabinet committee. So uh, it consists of a group of senior ministers agreeing the government's policy on particular issues. It's supported by the cabinet secretariat in the same, as, same way as any other committee. Um, the difference is essentially that it's chaired by the Prime Minister and also it meets weekly, which is much more frequently than most cabinet committees. It's actually modelled on the National Economic Council that was set up at the end of, the last, end of last year uh, in order to lead the government's response to the economic crisis. Um, I did want to show you a photograph of it actually meeting, um, but the, the council meets in uh, the cabinet office briefing room or sometimes referred to as COBRA, uh, which is where sort of the response to any national emergency is coordinated. Um, and because of the nature of the room, we're not allowed to actually take photographs in there, so I can't show you a picture. Uh, let me just have this graphic. Um, what's the, the council looking at? Well, the, in the Prime Minister's statement, he said there'd be five things that he would be looking at, which are the ones shown here, and which you'll see some uh, continuity from the things that Alex was talking about earlier. Um, on the written constitution and the Bill of Rights, essentially this is about considering whether there should be a single document that brings together uh, all the sort of defining uh, things about how government works and about the relationship between government, parliament and the people. Um, the engagement in politics theme partly builds on the work of the Youth Citizenship Commission about how you engage young people in politics, but will also be looking at wider issues, not just to do with voting, but with how you encourage people to stand for local elections, for example, or uh, sit on um, national health bodies or police advisory bodies. The third theme, uh, which is a very strong theme from the whole talk today, is about House of Lords reform, um, completing the work that Alex was talking about that was started in 1999. On electoral reform, the question is, uh, again, should, should in particular in here, is should we look at a different system for election to the House of Commons? Uh, where clearly there's some strong views across the political spectrum. And finally, local democracy. This is about how you engage people in their local communities, looking at further at the question of elected mayors, um, responsibility at sort of city and regional level as opposed to just lo uh, local le level itself. Um, this is the first area where the government's actually really set out detailed proposals on any of these themes. 
Um, the Community Secretary, John Denham, gave a speech to the Local Government Association a week or so ago, um, and we'll shortly be publishing a more detailed white paper on that. Um, and then finally, some of you may have seen this document was published a week, week or two ago, um, Building Britain's Future, um, which is described as the government's plan to build a stronger, fairer, and more prosperous country. Um, it has a w very wide-ranging set of issues across the whole of government, um, but there is also a section in there about cleaning up politics, which has some specific proposals on ending the hereditary principle in the House of Lords, um, bringing forward a draft bill on wider House of Lords reform, and the Parliamentary Standards Authority, and also about a constitutional renewal bill. And those are all things that VJ is going to pick up and talk about in a bit more detail. Director in the Ministry of Justice. Um, and just to hold one picture in your minds at the moment, it's, it's that one from the, um, from the film The Perfect Storm, where the sort of nice, gentle ripples and, uh, and, and calm sea suddenly ra rises up into a series of mountainous waves that threatens to sort of sink everything in sight. That's what it feels like at the moment. Um, partly because sort of everything is up at the moment. And I'll come on a bit into the why, but you know, the why is to some extent obvious. Um, but it also creates quite a moment for constitutional change uh, in this country. The only reason why we're sort of surfing down the waves and, and not just drowning um, is because partly there are some extremely good people and I'm lucky enough to have a, a stupendous team in the Ministry of Justice drawn from across Whitehall and wider with wide um, experience and devolved administrations in all sorts of departments because when the Ministry of Justice was formed only a couple of years ago, a lot of people came in from across the whole of um, the whole of government, which is a tremendous strength. Um, we do elections. If you ever wondered who runs elections, uh, who's sort of involved in trying to work the, uh, the general election up, whenever that happens, uh, with the Electoral Commission and uh, returning officers, that's us. We do human rights for the UK, a constitutional system, and uh, uh, relations with the judiciary building on the stuff that Alex was talking about, about the 2005 CRA. Uh, my own background is from the Foreign Office originally, but having worked for Burr and uh, DFID uh, and, of course, the FCO at various times. Now, Parliamentary Standards Bill. Um, we had a turbulent three days in the Commons last week. We'll have a turbulent couple of days this week in the Lords and then some more time uh, what does it do? The idea is that by recess, we have royal assent to an independent regulator for parliament, basically. And there's been a huge amount of argument about how independent and sh how much should it regulate. Um, the main things it's going to do is to set up uh, the independent parliamentary standards authority, which is going to put forward, um, and this is very old hat to all of you, but it will put forward a system for allowances and expenses in a transparent way. It ought to set some clear rules so you know what, or MPs know what they can claim and what they can't claim, and it'll pay the money to them. Uh, it'll probably take some of the money back if it's paid incorrectly. It'll probably create some criminal offenses for MPs, and that's where the press coverage has so far gone, um, which is if MPs do a false claim, then they'll uh, we'll be able to prosecute them. The, the prosecution service will be able to prosecute them. Um, and it will uh, make the consequent changes to the way that uh, Parliament functions. Questions of privilege will come up, which is where there's been a huge series of arguments. Um, it'll set up an investigating commissioner to look at breaches of all of these rules. So for the first time, we ought to have something which has clear rules, what MPs can claim, what they can claim for, what they can't claim for. There'll be transparency, so their claims ought to be public. Uh, and there'll be some kind of a system to uh, go after them if they've made a wrong claim. Um, it's not particularly revolutionary in the civil service, but as you can see, we're having quite a lot of difficulty getting a, uh, a system like that through Parliament. Um, we're hoping to set all this up by the time of the next Parliament. So having a movable goalpost of a 
general election sometime in the nearest future doesn't particularly help your project and program planning. Um, the team is up and running. We're, we, we are trying to work out some of the consequentials. I should just say, it, it's actually remarkably tricky. Uh, the usual way of these things is um, uh, Parliament uh, controls the executive, controls the money we spend, votes money to us. What we're trying to do here is slightly in reverse, isn't it? We're trying to go and get money off Parliament, take away the members' vote, um, give it to an independent authority. It's the executive um, very much interfering deep into Parliament. So we're having to walk a number of very subtle constitutional tightropes here. So Christopher Kelly is meant to be reporting by the autumn of this year on what the software should be. And in essence, we're setting up the hardware, the system that can actually run uh, an allowances system. But what should that allowances system be? And that's very much for Christopher Kelly to come up with, uh, and then for this new body to decide whether it wants to adopt that and how far it's going to go. We've got big questions about the size of it. Um, if it is going to be a proper efficient body, it really needn't be particularly big. Uh, we've got questions about its role. Um, I don't think many of us get individually tailored advice on how we can maximize our claims on expenses. Uh, I can see you all saying, I wish. Um, question, should this new body do what the fees office has done for quite a while with MPs and continue to provide quite such a brilliant service? Um, there's the question on money I've, uh, I've mentioned. Uh, and then finally, there is also a link to the wider issue of civil servant expenses. Uh, the amount of transparency is increasing. Gus O'Donnell's published his recently. Uh, GGs and, and Termsecs are going to do so relatively soon. Um, how far does this process go? And can we ensure that there's some parallelism between what we're doing to MPs, or actually what they're doing to themselves, and, uh, and what civil servants are doing? Scott's already mentioned the Constitutional Renewal Bill, and you'll notice most of the themes of this already. Um, the origin is way back in the governance of Britain, but the origin goes further back than that. It, it, one of the really strange issues of the, the British Constitution is that much of it still runs on the royal prerogative, so the, the sort of ancient power of kings. And if you want an example of who's running on the ancient power of kings, well, it's you. The whole civil service, pretty well without exception, though there are a couple, um, is founded, based, run entirely on the royal prerogative. Uh, that's a funny and rather large thing to run on a very undefined uh, power. So one of the basic ideas behind the Constitutional Renewal Bill has been to codify the royal prerogative, put it under the control of Parliament. Parliament clearly doesn't control at the moment things which are done under the royal prerogative very clearly. And many of the other bits on there fall in the same category. So protests around Parliament, that isn't, but that's repealing various provisions of SOCFOR, which were uh, very dampening of, um, of protests around Parliament. The civil service, as I've said, puts the civil service and all of us onto a statutory footing. It puts the civil service commissioners on a statutory footing. It puts the principles, the, um, the Northcote Prevalian principles of um, independence and appointment on merit and so on uh, into statute for the first time. It regularizes the position of special advisors. It um, sets up uh, and clarifies the position of the Minister of the Civil Service and gives him or her the power to run the civil service. The point on treaties is all about Parliament, uh, for the first time formally, having a role in signing, uh, in approving treaties before they're signed and ratified. There have been ancient rules called the Ponsonby Rules uh, running for a long time. This sets those up on, on, a, on a formal footing, on a statutory footing, so Parliament actually has a say in what treaties we, um, we sign and ratify. Uh, Lord's disqualification. I'm afraid that's the best picture I could come up with. Um, and that is really the outcome of cash for question. Uh, it was pretty obvious after uh, the four peers were investigated and two of them were disciplined that had they done something really bad, they couldn't have been kicked out of the House of Lords. Um, this will allow a, this will create a mechanism where we can actually uh, remove peers. The House of Lords has the power to remove peers who have been particularly naughty. Um, and the final part is uh, judicial appointments, which removes the prime minister out of some of the remaining judicial appointments that he still uh, is a part of, um, completing really the package of judicial appointments changes, uh, which Scott referred to, uh, done by the um, Constitutional Renewal uh, Act. Now, 
Now, this may not be exactly on your radar, but it's quite big and it's coming. Um, individual registration is the biggest electoral system change that we currently have planned. So obviously, the work that Scott has outlined, the consultations about voting systems and so on, may take us into much bigger territory. At the moment, though, this is arguably the biggest uh, electoral system change since um, universal suffrage, and possibly even uh, before that. Um, as you all no doubt know, at the moment, when you register to vote, it's done household by household. The head of household has to fill out the form, put everyone on it, and send it back. Uh, it's really quite a centuries-old system. Um, what ministers, and this is widely shared across uh, different parties and across the commons and lords, what they want is much higher registration rates. We're fairly low at the moment, better security, um, and a more efficient system for doing electoral registration. Um, and so the, uh, the basic idea behind individual registration is that each of us will go and register individually. Uh, we'll each have an entry on the electoral register, and, and I know this will come as a real shock, we can only have one. At the moment, if you wanted, and you will be a bit sad to do this, but you could register 468 times and then try and vote in every one of those constituencies. And we don't have a system to check that you're not doing that. Uh, that's the security element, or at least part of it. Uh, it's pretty difficult to uh, register if your head of household doesn't want to register you. That's not particularly good, particularly in, say, multiple occupancy households or, uh, or in some families. Um, and more efficient system, basically, we're still running to quite an extent on paper with 469 uh, separate uh, IT systems, some of whom, most of whom, don't talk to each other. The idea is that we will run a large program starting now, going for about the next uh, six, seven years, uh, which is going to set up a system where we can all register individually. And that by itself will probably bring quite a lot of electoral changes. Um, because in parallel with that is a lot of work to raise the registration rate. Uh, across the civil service, we've got a lot of data on people. Um, DWP have a lot, DVLA have a lot. Uh, the benefits database is huge. Can we, and this moment is posed as no more than a question, can we use that data to encourage people to register? Can we go into schools when school leaders are leaving and encourage them to register? Um, is there a way of making it more of automatic part of life than having to fill out another form, which is a pretty big barrier for many people? Uh, and so one of the bigger uh, pieces of work that we're doing within this is, is data matching pilots, in particular looking at the National Insurance Number Database. Can we actually get people who are, you know, they've got the right nationality, they, we know where they live, uh, it's all there. Can we actually ask them, would you like to be on the electoral register rather than waiting for them to make the first move? And there's, I think there'll be quite a lot of work on this, which will probably touch quite a few departments. Now, written constitution and bill of rights. We have started a consultation on a bill of rights. And you may well ask, what is a bill of rights? Well, that's part of the consultation. Um, it's going to be, uh, if the consultation says, do you want one? What should be in it? How justiciable should it be? How many of these rights should our judges be able to, um, to decide on, to rule on? How many should be left firmly within the ambit of parliament in the realm of politics and government? Should a Bill of Rights be the kind of source of all these rights? That's a, a, a primarily sort of European-American concept where the Bill of Rights says, these are your rights. They can't be taken away from you. At the moment, of course, the source of all rights really is parliament. And to the extent it puts duties on public authorities, and again, that's you, um, from those duties spring the rights of citizens to demand of, of you what those, uh, what those duties are. Uh, should we include some of them things that I guess you would now think of as being almost rights within Britain, like the right to health care, free at the point of delivery, like the right to education, the right to housing. And there we get into very big money and very big questions of is it politics or is it law? The written constitution takes all those arguments up about a factor of 100. Um, question one, do we want one? Question two, what does this do to the supremacy of parliament? Question three, what does this do to the courts? Does it make the Supreme Court really supreme? 
question three, scale. Are we looking for a short, catchy pocketbook kind of constitution, or sort of the US style? Are we looking for a, I can't put this nicely really, a German, European style constitution, so 400 pages that lands on your doorstep with a thud and nobody likes and probably votes against. What's the process to get legitimacy for this thing um, in a world of parliamentary supremacy? Would it be good enough if parliament one day voted this thing and said, there you are, that's the constitution. Uh, do we want, do citizens want some more of a role in that? Does it have to be approved by a referendum? And if it does, how do you change it? And if it's a referendum, what does that do to parliamentary sovereignty and parliamentary supremacy? And those, I think, are going to be quite a lot of the questions. Um, and I'm not going to give it any answers because there aren't really very many clear answers. There are a lot of positions one can take. But they, they end up being balances between the various difficulties, evils, and possibly the good that can come out of a written constitution. But we're probably going to be consulting on this over this summer and the rest of this year. And finally, back to our favorite theme of all three speakers, House of Lords reform. Um, when are we going to finish this? You'll have seen the thread running through for a long time now. We've been doing bits of it. Uh, the major element of House of Lords reform um, took out, if you remember, uh, most of the hereditary peers apart from the 92. Um, the final stage of House of Lords reform would be to move to a wholly or 80% uh, elected House of Lords, uh, removing the hereditary, the final 20% would be appointed, and before the summer, uh, the government's going to come forward with a detailed proposal saying what it actually thinks should happen. There are lots of different views. Uh, it's probably time to put forward a single clear proposal that actually works. But it does take us into some, uh, it, it means that we have to answer clearly the questions which we've only asked questions on so far. So what should the electoral system be for members of the House of Lords? How do you make sure the Commons stays the prime chamber, the supreme chamber? Uh, because that's the view of the Commons. Um, what should the role of this new, um, this new House of Lords be? Uh, and this is where I think life gets very interesting for, uh, for many civil servants. Uh, I'm sure many of you have had the opportunity to be grilled by uh, House of Lords committees. It's, it's a profoundly scary experience because they know what they're talking about. Uh, and many of them used to be civil servants, they used to be perm sex, uh, and they're very good at grilling. Uh, would a new body, an elected body, be able to perform the same function? Would it be as good a check? Would it be as good at getting the detail right? Would it produce reports, which is widely uh, used and respected uh, across the world, really? What do we do with the bishops and the goats? Uh, the bishops being the bishops. Uh, would we still want them in the House of Lords? The goats being the government of all the talents. So when the Prime Minister wants to appoint someone to a ministerial position, who isn't an MP, can they add him into the House of Lords? Can they uh, do something else? And we'll have to come forward with some fairly clear ideas uh, on all of those questions. But what I can say on this one is watch this space uh, and maybe even read it and respond when you get the consultation. And the final thing is the UK Supreme Court. And I've saved the best for last, really. Um, this is, if you remember, the bit of it that we have actually done, delivered, finished. Um, I'll hand over the building in three weeks' time to the new Chief Executive of the Supreme Court. It starts on the 1st of October. The opening ceremony is a couple of weeks later. And we will then have, for the first time, a Supreme Court of the United Kingdom. Um, what does this mean? Well, the original ideas of the program were to increase the transparency of this. Almost nobody knew who the law lords were, where they were, ever saw a case. The whole thing happened in really not so much secrecy, just obscurity. The second idea was the separation of powers. It's strange to have the judges, particularly the top judges, sitting in with uh, the legislators, in this case the Lords. And the third uh, objective of the program was to renovate this particular building, which is on Parliament Square. It's the Middlesex Guild Hall. It's been a court for about a thousand years. Uh, it's been a torture chamber for even longer. Um, and I hope the building is now so beautiful, it will not live up to that last drilling. Uh, we did find some interesting things buried in the basement as we dug foundation and so. 
Um, the law lords move, all 12 of them, to this new building. It's a glorious inside, um, and I hope you can all visit. Uh, that's the first time I've really been able to say that. Before, it was actually quite difficult to go and visit the law lords or find out where, where they were or what they were doing. Now, I think it's 24 and a half million people walk around Parliament Square every year. Uh, quite a large proportion of them are going to probably go into Supreme Court because it's got the only free toilets on Parliament Square and quite a good cafe. I can guarantee that one. Um, so I thought I'd be the first. Where does that leave us? Well, we'll have a Supreme Court which will do very much the same things that the law lords have been doing. It's not a profound change now, but every one of these constitutional changes has long-term ramifications. Freedom of information, look at where that's got us, and it's only been going a couple of years. I think the Supreme Court, and this is my personal opinion, uh, will be a similar change. That the law lords, uh, in sort of much more transparency and clarity, uh, will want to make the most of that position. They are uh, an enormously uh, powerful and intellectually powerful group of people, and I think we will see the role of the Supreme Court steadily increasing in the minds of people in this country, uh, and the role of the judiciary creeping up as well. Um, my conclusions overall on the current constitutional changes is, first of all, uh, give us a break. Um, we're trying to, to get through this whole lot, and things are moving extremely fast. Um, the Constitution's almost fluid at the, at the moment. Everything, every single element needs to be under question. Now, that doesn't mean that all will change, and much of it works very well. Many of the previous changes work tremendously well, but there's a lot more to come. Uh, part of these changes are the unfinished business, like the Lords. Part of them are the consequentials of the previous set of constitutional changes. And I think it would be very brave uh, of anyone to try to predict exactly where we end up. I think the mere fact that we are now into full-scale public consultation on a written constitution shows just how open uh, everything can be.